All right, welcome everyone to lecture 18 of 287, Advanced Robotics. Today we're going to cover uh, our first uh, session on reinforcement learning. First, a few quick logistical announcements. You have a homework four due on Monday, and you have your final project proposal due on Wednesday. So keep that in mind. Uh, Wednesday is your final project proposal deadline. Um, final project is supposed to be something more open-ended than homework. Uh, ideally, something researchy, but it doesn't. I mean, have to be a paper, but. Hopefully the best projects do turn into papers, ultimately. Um, it's about investigating something open-ended related to the class. If you're not really sure what to do for your final project, contact us and we can help brainstorm together. Any logistical questions? All right, then let's get started. So we have a lot to cover today. I don't think we're going to cover all of this today. We'll see. Um, we'll probably continue next week. Um, I want to do a quick refresher of MDPs, then we'll switch to reinforcement learning. We'll look at policy optimization. And mostly, I'm going to want to look with you at policy gradients. But before doing so, I want to highlight two other policy optimization methods that are also model free, that in principle are also available to you and are often easy to try and worth trying uh, just as a quick check. Sometimes they work really well. All right, so quick refresher on MDPs. In an MDP, we have an agent interacting with the world, and the goal is for the agent to maximize expected reward in that environment. And the assumption is the agent gets to observe the state. More formally, under the hood, what we have is we have a set of states that's given to us, a set of actions that's given to us, a transition model given to us, a reward function given to us, and then there might be a discount factor um, that's given to us. And then hope is that we can find a policy pi star which maximizes expected reward. We'll still have the fa same formalism, but in reinforcement learning, what's going to change is that while we have the same system in action, we don't have access to the dynamics model of the world, and we don't have direct access to the reward function. So the agent is now expected to optimize expected reward without having access to the underlying description of the system. So as a consequence, the agent will need to learn to optimize the expected reward by acting in the environment, learning about properties of the environment, and based on that, improving its behavior and collecting more and more reward over time. Now, within reinforcement learning, there's actually quite a wide range of uh, methodologies. And I would say there's really two big categories. There is policy optimization methods, which say, OK, what we ultimately need to find is a policy. So let's just focus on that, and let's see um, how we can maybe start from some policy and improve it over time to get a better policy. On the other hand, there are dynamic programming methods. Those methods look at essentially the Bellman update. They say, OK, there's this Bellman equation that relates the optimal value function uh, for k time steps to go to the one for k plus 1 steps to go. And if we run this forever, we get the optimal value function for infinite horizon. It's a fixed point equation. If we can find a solution to that fixed point equation that comes from dynamic programming, then from that, we can derive the optimal policy with one step look ahead. Or if we do it with q functions rather than v value functions, then it's already encoded right in there what the policy is going to be. And so these really exploit different things or different ways of looking at the problem. Policy optimization, which we'll cover today, is really about a optimization of the policy directly. And dynamic programming methods focus on the value function aspect first. Now, there is something that lives at the junction of both called actor critic methods, and we'll also look at those. It takes some aspects of policy gradient, some aspect of dynamic program, and bring them together in one method. So let's start with policy optimization. So in policy optimization now, effectively the agent is some policy. And we'll have some external mechanism, hopefully, available to improve that policy over time. For example, the policy could be a neural network that goes from current observation to action taken. And so 
if this neural network is parameterized by a parameter vector theta, then really what we're doing is solving this optimization problem. Maximize expected sum of rewards accumulated over time under the policy pi theta. And if we change the policy pi theta, we can run that new policy, maybe 100 rollouts, and see how much reward it accumulates and compare. And so we have a very direct measurement of how well we're doing. We can just, for at any given point in time, roll it out, evaluate performance, and see if we've been improving or not. Typically, even though we know that the optimal policy in an MDP, or there is an optimal policy that's deterministic in an MDP, if there are ties, then there could be a stochastic optimal policy. But generally, the optimal policy in an MDP is deterministic will actually optimize over a much wider class of policies, which is stochastic policies, which of course include deterministic ones for a very special kind of distribution. Um, so you might wonder, why do that? If we know the optimal policy is deterministic, why optimize over stochast all stochastic policies? It's really two reasons. One reason is that, um, well, if we have an approximate solution we're trying to come up with. We parameterize the policy. It's not guaranteed necessarily that in a parameterized uh, uh, setting that uh, we have a deterministic policy as the optimal one. Second, and more importantly, it smooths out the problem. Because by having stochastic policy class, you can make a small change to your policy, shifting a little bit of probability mass from one action to another action in some state. And that's a very gradual change. Whereas if you have deterministic policies, and let's say discrete actions, then as you switch an action in some state, you have a discrete change, and it's not a smooth optimization problem. So by looking at stochastic policies, we get a smooth optimization problem, even in the case that we have discrete actions. You might wonder, well, why policy optimization? I mean, value function methods are, are good, too. And I'm not going to try to declare one is better than the other. They have different benefits. Um, but here are some benefits of why you might care about policy optimization. For many problems, the policy could be simpler than the value function. Imagine, let's say, a robotic grasp. A robot's supposed to pick something up. The strategy might be relatively simple for some objects. You have, just have to move towards it with an open gripper, then close around the object, then you have the object. So that's a relatively simple strategy. But if you think about what's the value, then you have to think about exactly how long is it going to take before I actually have grasped the object, because that's all encoded in the value function through the discounting. And all of a sudden, you have a much harder problem to figure out. If you learn a value function, you actually don't directly know what to do. You still need to do one step look ahead. So we need to not just learn a value function, but also a dynamics model, so we can do one step look ahead with that dynamics model to know what to do. And so now all of a sudden we need to learn two things. And if an error in one of them is happening, then we have an error in the action we take. You could also learn a Q function. Um, but often for continuous spaces, the argmax over all the actions available to you of the Q values uh, function can be pretty expensive to compute. So other challenges there. Now, again, I'm not trying to say conclusion is we should always do policy optimization. I'm just saying these are reasons why policy optimization could be a very valid method for you to use. Um, in addition to this, actually, there's a very practical uh, reason that is not on the slides, which is you can always evaluate your performance. With the value function method, you can evaluate performance by using one step look ahead, but you're not directly optimizing it. So you're not guaranteed in every update to your value function that your performance is improving. Whereas with policy optimization, with every update you can check and directly improve it over time. Another reason you might care about policy optimization is because there's been a lot of success with it. So here are some of the pioneering successes with uh, policy optimization. Uh, the first one is four-legged locomotion, then helicopter flight, two-legged locomotion, ball in a cup problem, Atari games, uh, navigation in a uh, labyrinth, um, Mujoko style simulated control problems, real robot control problems, and Go, where it was a combination of policy optimization and value function optimization. So a lot of the early success stories in reinforcement learning have been through policy optimization. Taking another slice of it, um, if you look at conceptually, policy optimization optimizes directly what you care about. 
Whereas in dynamic programming, it's very indirect. You exploit the problem structure. You know that there is some structure that if the Bellman equation is satisfied, you should be optimal. But when you only approximately satisfy it, it's less clear how well you're going to do. Policy optimization tends to be more compatible with rich architectures, including recurrences, more versatile, and more compatible with auxiliary objectives. Um, because maybe you want your network to learn against multiple objectives rather than just the reinforced learning objective. Having auxiliary objectives can help you learn more quickly about structure in the environment because the reward might be sparse. And on the other hand, dynamic programming is more compatible with exploration and off-policy learning and is more sample efficient uh, when they work because of the compatibility with off-policy learning. One quick note, we've actually done policy optimization before. ILQR is a policy optimization method. The optimization-based control methods, collocation, shooting, MPC, contact invariant optimization, they're all policy optimization methods. But these assumed access to the dynamics model and the reward function, which we don't have available now in reinforcement learning. Note that in the third lecture on RL, we'll look at model-based RL, and in model-based RL, we learn a dynamics model, we learn a reward function, and then we can start applying those methods, methods again. But right now, we're going to look at model-free methods where we don't try to learn a model, we don't have a model either, we just interact with the world and see if we can directly optimize the policy. Any questions about the context in which we're working? OK, so we'll see three model-free policy optimization methods. We'll see or three categories, finite differences, cross-entropy, and policy gradients. The first two we'll do relatively quickly. They're also simpler from a conceptual point of view, but often they can work and we want to be aware of them. So finite differences. This is really about. We have now a policy we try to optimize. And we don't have access to the dynamics model, so we can not do our back variation through time to get a derivative of our policy parameters um, to do an update. But we can actually do a finite difference. We can say, well, we have some parameter vector theta. We can perturb an entry in theta, making it a little more positive, plus epsilon, minus epsilon. Compare how well we do by doing two rollouts. And that gives us a finite difference estimate of the derivative with respect to that one component in our parameter vector theta. And then we can do this for every entry in our parameter vector theta, and we get an approximation of the gradient. And to do this, we don't need access to a model. We just need to be able to do rollouts. We roll out with different perturbations of the parameter vector theta. Now, this is fairly straightforward. I mean, you can always do this to get approximations to your gradient. Um, and actually, I would say, when, you, when I say approximations, I would say it's actually, it actually can be a better approximation at times, because it's over a slightly wider interval than totally local. And so sometimes it's a better approximation than the actual derivative in terms of what you'll want to use in your optimization. But there can be some challenges. Um, one of the challenges is that often your system is stochastic. And imagine you have a stochastic system. And in your stochastic system, we, you um, perturb theta, and you get an outcome. So vertical axis here is the sum of rewards that you get back. Horizontal axis is our one parameter theta that we can change. And we see that for this, let's see, we see that for this setting over here of theta, we have a distribution over possible returns. And we did a rollout, and we happen to get this thing over here. Now, for the new setting of theta, we also have a distribution over possible returns. But we do one rollout, so we get one sample from that distribution, and we happen to land over here. And so by doing one rollout for one setting of theta, another rollout for another setting of theta, in this case, we're actually misinformed about the gradient. Because by these two samples, it seems like the second theta is actually worse based on the two samples we got. But in reality, the underlying trend is that it's better. And so what we have here is noise in our gradient estimate because of the 
stochasticity in the rollouts that we do. So what can we do about this? Well, if there's stochasticity, one thing you can do is you can average. If you average over multiple rollouts, this effect should go away. Because then you should get the mean for each setting of theta, and you can compare the means, and you have the trend that you want. Um, well, the one thing about doing that is that if you average over many samples, you pay a high cost. You are now doing many, many rollouts to just get one derivative entry. But what else can we do? Well, it depends. But imagine, imagine you have access to the actual simulator. Then one thing you could do is you could say, I'm just going to get rid of the noise. I'm just going to always output the mean next state and make it into a deterministic dynamic system. But now you're losing some aspects of what the system is really like. We can make a slight tweak on this. What we can do is when we do two rollouts, we can fix the random seed. And so across the two rollouts, the same random seed is used. So you end up with the same offset from the mean across the two rollouts. And that way, you get a correct derivatives out. Um, well, the randomness could be both in the policy and in the dynamics. In the policy, you always have control over it. So you can just fix the random seed at the beginning of your run, and that's it. Um, in the dynamics, you don't always have control. But sometimes you do. If it, you do it in simulation, you have control over it. If you do it in real world, often you don't. Um, what's an example in practice? Imagine you have a helicopter trying to learn to fly, and the world is stochastic, meaning the wind gusts experienced by the helicopter are going to be different in every rollout. Then the wind gusts could potentially have a higher effect on the performance than the actual change in your parameter setting. So you need to be aware of that and maybe collect multiple rollouts, or maybe you just need to make bigger changes in your parameter setting so it has a bigger effect compared to the wind, but it really depends on what's practical with your system. This idea of fixing the random seed whenever you can do it can be very, very powerful and can be applied across other methods too. So right now I'm talking about um, perturbation uh, for a finite difference approximation to the gradient. But you can do the same thing for evolutionary methods, cross-entropy method. You do multiple rollouts. You want to compare them in an on-par way. So if you fix the random seed, you get more on-par comparison. So let's look at an example of this in action. So for this helicopter, a uh, simulator was built. Then in the simulator, policy optimization was run in a model-free way. So there's a policy that's parameterized in some way. The parameters get fi you do find a difference to see where you should update each parameter in which direction, repeat many, many times. Once your optimization has converged, you deploy it on real helicopter. And here is what you get. So we have a policy that's reliably controlling this helicopter, which has a very hard control problem, um, even harder when you fly upside down. And um, this was first enabled through reinforcement learning. If you're curious about what's under the hood, um, well, what's under the, under the hood here is a policy that's highly parameterized. Why? Well, if you do this finite difference kind of thing, you're not uh, super sample efficient, because to get a gradient, you need to do, if you have, let's say, 100, 100 entries in your parameter vector, you need to do 200 rollouts. So it gets expensive very quickly. Um, but here, the number of parameters is only 12, so you only need essentially 24 rollouts to do the finite difference and be able to do an update. It's parameterized in a very specific way. There are four controls to your helicopter. There's the vertical control, the collective control, which changes the angle of the blades. The steeper the angle of the blades, the more air you push down. And so the more force you get up on the helicopter, that's the collective control. And it says, OK, well, that's going to depend on my z coordinate and my z velocity, because that's the main thing I care about for that vertical. And then the elevator and aileron controls are essentially changing the angle of attack of the blades as you cycle through your 360 rotation. You could have a steeper angle left versus right, or a steeper angle front versus back, 
and that will result in differential amount of air being pushed down front, back, left, right, which will start rotating your helicopter. So those two control the angular rate, really, around the forward axis and the sideways axis of the helicopter. And what is that is? That depends on the X coordinate, you imagine X, let's say X is forward, then you care about um, putting your nose down or up to be able to move forward or backwards. Um, so X is in there, and then the angle uh, denoted by, uh, the angular rate denoted by Q is in there, and the actual angle denoted by NY. And then aileron is the same thing for the lateral direction. And then the rudder controls the angle of attack of the tail rotor which will influence how much your tail spins around. But actually, the most important thing is that um, because of the counter torque from the motor, between the motor and the helicopter, by default, the helicopter would counter spin to the blades. And you don't want to be spinning all the time. And so the tail rotor's main effect is to make sure that you have a counter torque to the helicopter spinning and keeping it stable. But then, of course, you want to change the direction you're facing. You can adjust the tail rotor thrust a little bit to point in a different direction. So those are the four control inputs you have. It was parameterized in a way for them to depend specifically on the variables that you think matter the most. That way you reduce the number of uh, parameters in your uh, policy to 12, and it's possible to train with finite differences in a pretty efficient way to find a good controller. Here's another example of uh, results of policy optimization with finite differences. Oh, video, this snake. The policy is parameterized by effectively a, a sine wave pattern, and you choose how much you activate to so the amplitude of the sine wave of controls along the length of the snake, as well as the phase offsets between the different frequency sine waves. And so there's a handful of parameters there that you then optimize, and you get out um, something that can actually climb up on a step. Similarly, for the four-legged robot, um, here is a essentially hard-coded policy. Because once you parameterize your policy, you could also make your own guesses at the parameters and put something in place and then play with it a little bit until you find a good setting. Then you can train it, collecting your rollouts um, with different settings of those parameters, perturbing them to get your finite differences, do updates over time, and then after it's fully trained, here's what you get, which is faster walking, which is really important for uh, winning RoboCup games because, I mean, if you can run faster than your opponents, you can, of course, get to the ball more quickly. And actually, this is the team that used to win pretty much all the time in, in this league. So finite differences can work quite well. Um, most success, however, is in low dimensional spaces. But if you have a low dimensional problem, you might as well try it, and it could be a good way to sanity check your other implementations against. What else do we have? Um, we can look at cross-entropy method, or more generally, evolutionary methods. What do evolutionary methods do? They say, well, we still want to optimize our policy. And a Taylor algorithm would be something along the lines of, make some random change to the parameters. If the result improves, keep the change. If the result doesn't improve, discard the change and repeat. Or you could do this at a population level. You have a bunch of policy parameter settings. You perturb all of them, and then the ones who do better, you keep. The ones who do worse, you discard, and then you kind of regenerate to regrow your population. Once you do that at population level, effectively you get the cross-entropy method. So cross-entropy method says we initialize some mean and some variance for a Gaussian representing our parameter vector. Then we iterate, we sample parameter vectors, full parameter vectors from that Gaussian. So I here, theta i is a full parameter vector, not just one entry in a parameter, there's a full parameter vector. We sample a parameter vector from the Gaussian. For each one of them, we then perform a rollout to get a return, which scores how good that parameter vector is. Then we can look at the top k percent, let's say top 10 percent of rollouts, fit a new diagonal Gaussian to the parameter vectors corresponding to them, and repeat. That's cross-entropy. We saw that in one of the first lectures. It's a policy optimization method. It's model-free. You don't need access to a dynamics model to do this. You just need to be able to do rollouts, get the evaluations back, and then you can update your um, mean and variance of the Gaussian here. Cross-entropy uh, is very simple. It can work surprisingly well. Um, 
it's very scalable because it's very parallelizable, what I just described. It's 100% parallelizable, which is really nice. If you look at the experiments with um, cross-entry method, the, the scaling is essentially linear, meaning that as you increase the number of machines you run it on, you linearly speed up with the number of machines, your uh, number of evaluations you can do in the speed at which you get to your results. It does not take advantage of any temporal structure. And I would say that's really the key thing we're going to start doing. And what follows is um, we're going to find a method that really takes advantage of temporal structure and also, compared to finite differences, doesn't need two rollouts per single entry in the gradient vector. All right. Any questions about everything we covered so far? Because we're going to completely switch gears to policy gradient methods now. All right, let's do policy gradients. All right, so a bit of notation to get started. We're interested in optimizing the sum of rewards accumulated over time. And we're going to have a shorthand notation for that. So So tau stands for trajectory, and it's going to be state at time 0, controls at time 0, state at time 1, controls at time 1, all the way till state at time h. Maybe controls at time h. They don't tend to matter, really, but it's simpler to have state and control everywhere to not have to special case the last time slice. We'll then also say r tau is equal to sum t equals 0 through h r s t u t. And in this new notation, our goal is to find a policy pi theta that maximizes u, which depends on our choice of theta which is the expected sum of rewards assuming we act according to pi theta which is equal to the sum over all possible trajectories we might experience the probability of experiencing that trajectory when using the policy pi theta times the reward along that trajectory. 
So, this here is the thing we're trying to optimize. Now realizing it's hiding a little bit of structure, I'm hiding the fact that tau is really a sequence of states and actions. Um, but for now, that will be convenient. And later, we'll bring that back. Um, but we'll start with this abstraction. Now, what's the likelihood ratio policy gradient? So a lot of people just call it policy gradient. And so you'll have to get used to different people using slightly different terminology. So often it's just called policy gradient, what we're going to cover. Um, but in principle, if you think about the fundamental mathematical meaning of a policy gradient, a policy gradient can be computed in many, many ways. Um, using finite differences as a way to approximate the policy gradient, using backpropagation through time, if you have a dynamics model and a reward function available, also gives you a gradient of the policy. So there's many ways to get it. Now in practice, people often use the likelihood ratio policy gradient, and often in shorthand just say policy gradient. But just to be clear, in principle, we know other ways of computing policy gradients. But now we're looking at this one, and we'll see good reason why this one's so popular as we progress. So again, this is our objective. So we really try to optimize respect to theta. And as we know, often we can't do it in closed form. So we'll use a gradient with respect to theta to do an update and repeat. All right, so what's the gradient here? Gradient respect to theta of u of theta is equal to gradient respect to theta sum over tau probability of trajectory tau under theta times r tau. Now, the gradient of a sum is the sum of the gradients. So we can bring that in. We'll bring this gradient in. Now also, the reward of a trajectory does not depend on the parameter vector we used. The reward just depends on the states and actions that were taken. So as denoted here, no dependence on theta. So really all we have is gradient respect to theta of probability trajectory tau theta times r tau. Now we'll play a special trick, which only in hindsight might be meaningful, but you'll see that it works out well for us. We'll multiply and divide by the same entity, p tau theta, p tau theta, times grad theta, p tau theta, r, theta, r tau. Now, let's look at this combination here. The gradient of p over p itself, that's the gradient of the log of p. So we can rewrite this as sum over tau p tau theta times grad theta log p tau theta times r tau. Now, typically, there's a very large number of trajectories that are possible. And summing over all possible trajectories over in, or in continuous space, integrating over all possible trajectories is impractical. So we're going to have to use a sample-based approximation of this. Actually, might still, might still fit here. Um, Sample-based approximation. Can people see the bottom of the board from the back? It's fine. Great. We're going to do a sample-based approximation. So it's approximately 
because it's sample base now equal to the average over m trajectories tau. So tau i, i from 1 through m. We're going to average. So this is an expectation here under this distribution. We can compute this expectation by taking samples from that distribution. How do we do that? We do a rollout. So this is a distribution over trajectories under our policy pi theta. So we use our policy pi theta, do a bunch of rollouts, and then instead of, and then we can compute the average. This is the quantity we're averaging. So then we say, okay, it's the average of that quantity. So the average of the grad theta log p tau theta times r tau, but now index the taus by i's because we have sample trajectories tau i rather than summing over all of them. Note that this probability distribution here disappeared in what we have below. It didn't disappear in a bad way. It's still there implicitly, but we don't write it anymore here because the sampling is taking care of the averaging. Because right, this is an expectation with respect to this distribution. We take it empirically. We don't reweigh the samples by the distribution itself. That thing disappears. The expectation is done by samples. So this is our policy gradient um, equation. Now let's inspect this and maybe retrospect why we did what we did. In principle, we already had a policy gradient equation here. That's a policy gradient equation just as well. So why did we keep going? Well, here you have a sum over all trajectories, inf possibly infinite integral and so forth. So it's a complex thing to compute. So the reason we actually multiplied and divided by the probability distribution here is that we could introduce the probability distribution up front, giving us an expectation. Once we have an expectation, we can replace it by an empirical average. And so the multiply and divide here was done to end up with an expectation of a slightly different quantity, a grad log rather than grad quantity, but that's fine. And then we can take the empirical version of that expectation to tractably compute an approximate policy gradient. Now, when you look at this equation, kind of one thing that's quite interesting is that we never take the derivative of the reward function r. Even though our objective is optimizing expected reward, and you might naturally imagine like gradient of that thing should then have gradients of where the reward is coming from, it's actually not showing up here. Um, Somewhat surprising in some ways. Intuitively, why is this happening? Because the way we formulated it is because we're saying we're optimizing a distribution over trajectories. And what we're really doing is shifting probability mass around, which is very different from what we used to do in our optimization for control methods, where we had a single trajectory and we tried to shift the trajectory. So we're doing something very different here. In the Early lectures, we had single trajectory, tried to shift the trajectory, make it better. Here we say, we're considering all trajectories. We're just trying to make sure the mass, probability mass, lives mostly on the good ones. And so it's a very different perspective on things. So we don't need a derivative then with respect to the reward, of the reward function with respect to anything, which means that this kind of policy gradient can be calculated for reward functions that are discontinuous. You could have a 0, 1 reward function, and you can still have a gradient. And this also ties back to my earlier comments saying that by looking at stochastic fam the family of stochastic policies, we make the problem smoother. We can make gradual changes. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we can gradually shift probability mass, have a smooth optimization problem, even though the reward function could be discontinuous. So. Now, let's take another step. So it'd be nice to look in detail at this quantity over here. Well, the reward on a trajectory we will give. And when we do a rollout, something tells us this is how much reward you got. 
But how about the grad log probability of tau under theta? Can we compute that quantity? Well, let's see. Grad respect to theta log probability of our trajectory tau i under theta. So this, we did a rollout, our ith rollout, and we're curious about this quantity because we need it. Well, let's see. This is equal to grad respect to theta of log. And what lives inside here? Well, what's the probability of a trajectory? It's the product of the probabilities of all the transitions that happen along the trajectory. So product from, for t going from 0 to the end of the probability of st plus 1 encountered in trajectory i, given we were in state sti and took control uti. And then, of course, the probability of taking that specific control under pi theta. So this is our probability of that trajectory that we just experienced. This here is the dynamics model. This here is the policy. OK, now the log of a product is the sum of the logs. So let's apply that. Grad respect to theta of sum t from 0 through h of the log of what's inside. So log. P st plus 1 i given st i u t i plus greater respect to theta of sum t equals 0 through h log pi theta u t i given st i. Now something interesting happens. The first term here, grad respect to theta of this quantity, this quantity does not have theta in it. And the grad of something respect to theta that doesn't have theta in it is 0. This does not depend on theta, so this is equal to 0 plus then this thing over here. And this is pretty exciting what's happening here, because when we looked at this original objective that we need to take derivative of, well, the dynamics appeared, and we're not, we're not having access to the dynamics in the current scenario. And actually, it turns out we don't need to. The dynamics disappears when we take the gradients. So we're left with this thing over here. And this thing over here, the gradient of a sum is sum of the gradients. So sum over t equals 0 through h. Oh, I drop. Did I drop something? No, we got everything. So then we got grad theta log pi theta u t i given s t i. How about this quantity? This quantity we can compute easily. Our policy is what we, we have a parameterization for it. We choose our policy structure. We have access to it. Popular choice these days would be a neural network. You have a neural network that outputs a distribution over actions given state. And you can just do back propagation through the network to find the grad log probability of action given state. In fact, most, uh, most often have a neural network. You output a probability, and you optimize the log probability of the output. So you have to compute the grad log probability pretty much all the time. And so all the existing frameworks, even if they were originally built for classification or regression, they actually completely support this just as well. Grad log probability 
easily computed through TensorFlow, PyTorch, whatever you like to use. So once we have this thing over here, for our rollout, we can compute, we can compute this. Um, we have this quantity here. Then we multiply with the reward experienced along that trajectory. And we have one term in our gradient. Uh, and then we average a bunch of those terms. And together, we have an estimate of the gradient. So just to quickly recap, what is our procedure? Our procedure will be we have a current policy pi theta. We do m rollouts with the policy. Then for each rollout, we compute these quantities with some backpropagation through our policy network, let's say. And then we can multiply the quantity we get with the reward experience along the trajectory. And here is our gradient estimate. Then we can take a step in the direction of the gradient. Um, assume we're maximize, trying to maximize the road, take a step in the direction of the gradient, and repeat. OK, let's take a short break here. And after the break, we'll see an alternative derivation to this. All right, let's, uh, let's restart. Any questions about the first half? Yes? Um, so for the log pies, mm -hmm. how does policy gradient, like how stable is it um, with respect to rare events actually showing up in your look ahead or your trajectories? The reason why I ask is because the log of a very small number is going to be very negative. It's going to lead to a very big gradient update. Is there any concern? Um, I haven't seen I haven't seen that as a, any specific concern uh, that there would be instabilities in this log specifically, uh, or the gradient of that. Um, as to the question of what happens if, with rare event type things, really it will affect the number of samples you need to get a good grain estimate. So if there are very rare events that have extreme reward, then you somehow need to sample them. Because if they have extreme reward, they affect the objective quite a bit. And so where that's where, of course, exploration comes in and so forth. But essentially, the notion that things you don't do very often, and hence should still explore, have very high or very low reward, 
um, means that you need a lot of samples to experience them. All right, so we've seen one derivation of the likely ratio policy gradient here. Um, we've seen in detail how we can compute the actual um, term in there up here. Um, this will keep the same, meaning that we're not going to change this, but I'm going to give you a different derivation of this part over here. And the different derivation can give you some additional insight, uh, maybe make it look a little less magical about the multiply and divide and all of a sudden having this log in there and so forth. And also the new derivation could give us later um, actually something beyond just a gradient. It could give us a local approximation to the objective that we can do multiple optimization steps on instead of just getting the gradient out. So the derivation we'll see now is coming from important sampling. We're still interested in u as a function of uh, parameter vector theta. It's now going to be written as follows. So u of theta is the expected value when theta uh, tau, the distribution over, so the trajectories get sampled from a distribution according to theta of r tau. Now, in general, there's something called important sampling that says if you have the expected value of some quantity where if x is a random variable going to p of x, expected value of f of x, that's equal to the expected value when x is sampled according to q. But now we're off because we sample according to q, so our samples appear with the wrong frequencies. They appear with the frequency according to q rather than p. So to compensate for that, we're going to multiply with p of x, divide out the q effect times f of x. So that's an importance-based, importance -based, um, not estimate, this is exact of the expectation here. Now the reason you might switch to this as opposed to this is that maybe you have a distribution q you know how to sample from but you don't know how to sample from p. But you know how to evaluate p. You know when you have a sample, you can evaluate p of x. And so when that's the case, you want to find an ideally nearby distribution q that you can sample from and use important sampling to get your estimate. So then you'd say approximately equal to uh, 1 over m sum i equal 1 through m of um, p x i over q x i f of x i, where the x i are sampled from q as opposed to p. So that's an importance weighted estimate um, of the expectation. It's a general thing you can always, I mean, you can apply this, it's nothing to do with policy gradients or anything like that. We're just going to use this general idea within our policy gradient derivation here. So I talked about P and Q. In our case here, we're really P will correspond to pi theta that we're considering, a new distribution policy, policy we're considering. And q will be equivalent to pi theta old. So you have an old policy. And we can sample from the old policy. In fact, the old policy is available to us. We, run, we are sampling with the old policy. And we're curious if we can use those samples to say something about a new policy. And this tells us that indeed, in principle, we can. We can sample from q. And then it can tell us something about what the expect expectation would be if we were taking our expectation really with respect to p. And then we can imagine that we, as we vary p in this thing over here, varying p 
will give us different expectations, we can all do it with the same samples from Q. So we sample once from Q, then we vary P, and we get different outcomes here. And we can actually optimize P and try to find the P that gives us the best expectation. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to try to find the P that is the pi theta that gives us the best expectation based on all we have available is samples from Q, which is from our old policy. So this is equal to expected value. Theta comes from theta, tau comes from theta old, P tau respect to theta over P tau respect to theta old. We have to compensate then R of the trajectory. So I haven't written P and Q here. I've written P and P theta and P theta old. All right. Now, this is the exact same objective as we had before, just written differently and introduce this um, ratio. We can now say, OK, if this is the objective we're optimizing, we're trying to find the best pi theta, first thing we should do is compute a gradient, maybe, so we can take a step in the right direction. So what's our gradient respect to theta of u theta? Well, it's equal to gradient of expected value of expected value of gradient. So expected value tau according to theta old of gradient respect to theta p tau theta over p tau theta old. This is a different theta. The gradient doesn't affect this one. This is the actual theta. Then r tau. OK. Now imagine we are currently at theta old, and we want to understand what is our gradient then we should evaluate this gradient at theta old. Evaluate this thing at theta old. So then really we have here this thing evaluated at theta old. Well, looking at this, we actually see we get back what we had over here. This is the expectation under theta old, everything's theta old over there. Expectation of theta old of this ratio over here, which is the same ratio we have over here. So expectation over there, the expectation is now say sum over trajectories, p trajectory under theta. That summation is the same as the expectation. So actually, this thing here and this thing here are exactly the same. They're the exact same equation, just derived in a different way. And so what we see now is that we have two ways of deriving the same thing, because the next two steps we take there, well, they're going to be the same steps over here, because we're already at the identical spot between the two sides. We just came at it from a different direction. Over there, we multiply and divide by the same thing. It's a, it's a lot like the importance weighting, actually. It's just that we knew we we're going to use the same thing twice. Here, we have some, something more general. We multiply and divide by different things here, and then it cancels out over here. Um, so same thing. You might, you might wonder, why do we care about deriving the same thing twice? Well, this might give you a little more insight into what's really going on. What's really going on as we compute a policy gradient is that we have a importance-weighted objective we're optimizing. And we just locally take a step. But in principle, as we'll see uh, next lecture, we can take many, many more steps on this objective if we want to. We don't need to take just one step. And so we have a new objective that we're able to evaluate and repeatedly take steps on before we might then do new rollouts, establish our next objective, and repeat.
so we covered a lot on the board, actually. Um, we covered those first three bullet points. So let's step through what we have on the slides here. This matches our objective we put on the board. We derived the policy gradient equation and the sample-based representation thereof. We realized that even if the reward function is discontinuous, we still have a gradient, which is kind of crazy. Normally, when you have discontinuous functions, no gradients available. But the, by having a distribution, essentially a stochastic policy, we have a distribution over trajectories. And we're really shifting the mass of that distribution rather than trying to change any single trajectory. That's why this works out. So the intuition here is that you might have three rollouts. Some of them are better than others. And you try to shift the probability mass to the better ones. So you're just trying to change the probabilities of experienced paths. You're not trying to actually change the paths themselves. Then we saw, well, that grad log probability of trajectory, well, we, it might look scary because it has a dynamics model in the probability. But actually, the gradient, if you look at it, the dynamics model will not participate. And we get something that does not require a dynamics model to evaluate. Putting it all together, our grain estimate consists of we do a bunch of rollouts. Then over those rollouts, we average the grad log probability of trajectory times reward along the trajectory, where the grad log probability of trajectory can be given by the sum of grad log probabilities of each action given state. So all we need to compute is grad log probability of action given state for each time slice that we experienced. And that's enough to then compose our policy gradient estimate from that. Now, we saw an alternative derivation through importance sampling. Gives us the same policy gradient, um, exact same expression, just derived in a different way. Um, but this thing on top is often called a surrogate loss. And we can actually use this surrogate loss in the future and take multiple steps on it instead of just one gradient step. Now, what's left for us to do? Quite a few things, actually, to make this work. What I described so far, if you just implement it that way, it's going to be extremely sample inefficient. Um, we need to exploit more structure. So it's going to be actually unbiased, meaning that if you take infinitely many samples, you'll get the correct policy gradient. But the infinitely many samples part is something you don't want to do. And in practice, of course, infinite is never a practical thing to do. But the number of samples you need to get a reasonable estimate is going to be very, very high. We're going to reduce the need in terms of how many samples we need by reintroducing a baseline, exploiting more temporal structure, and then um, likely next lecture, looking at trust regions and natural gradients to further improve things. So again, let's look at the intuition. The intuition of a policy gradient that we just covered is that you're going to shift the probability mass. If paths have positive reward, you make them all the actions action given state along those trajectories more likely. And for every path that had negative reward, you decrease the log probability of action given state for everything you encounter along those paths. Now, some crazy things are going to happen. Imagine your rewards are always positive. Then for everything you experienced, you're trying to make the probability of your action given state more likely than it was before. Doesn't really work. Probability distribution have to sum to one. You can't make everything more likely. Essentially, you're trying to lift everything you experienced. Of course, it'll come at the expense of other things, but it's not a very intelligent way of doing things. Because if you experience something pretty bad, like almost zero, and the others are a hundred and a thousand, why are you still lifting the probability of that thing, even if you're lifting it less than the others? Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a baseline. The natural thing to say is that I don't want to increase the probability of everything I did. I just want to experience it, increase it if the experience was better than average. If my rollout was better than the average rollout, increase the probability of the actions given state, otherwise decrease. Can I do that? Well, you can. So you can subtract out a baseline. So B is a baseline. And you can think of it as. You know, simplest way to think of it is the average across all your rollouts of how much reward you got. You look at that average, and now when you subtract it out, anything that's above average, grad log probability gets increased. Everything that's below average, grad log probability goes down. There's a derivation on the left there, I'm not going to step through, but if you do the math, you'll see that subtracting that baseline does not affect the correctness 
of this being a policy gradient. <coughs> because it turns out if you compute the expectation of the baseline contribution, it's zero. It's just shown on the left. Now, it might sound a little magical, but it's just how the math works out. And intuitively what it comes down to is that um, it's OK to check whether you're better or worse than average rather than just in the absolute increase everything. And in fact, by doing this, you'll have less variance. You'll be able to get a preciser estimate of your gradient for a given number of samples. So this will reduce the sample complexity already quite a bit. Because now we move things up that are better than average, down that are worse than average, as opposed to trying to move everything up and then have the summing to one compensate for that ultimately. What else can we do? Well, let's look at the temporal structure. So the grad log probability is shown at the top for trajectories. Second line is really what we have now. But let's break it up. If you look at that second line and go to the third line, I broke it up into terms that happen before the current time slice and terms that happen from the current time slice onwards. You look at the grad log probability of action given state times the reward that happened before plus the reward that happened after. Well, the action you take at the current time cannot affect anymore the reward you got already in the past. So there's no way that the reward you got in the past should affect how much you increase or decrease the grad log probability of the current action given state. So we should just get rid of that term. Doesn't depend on you. We can just get rid of it. Um, we also realize that the baseline can actually depend on the state, because you can start at the current time and look at everything from there. And just keep it, B needs to be constant from there, but that's it. And so removing the terms that don't depend on current action can lower the variance. We end up with this equation over here. And now we're at a point that's actually pretty good. It also makes sense. We're saying the grad, we look at the grad log probability of action given state. And the amount by which we increase or decrease depends on how the reward we got from that time onwards in that trajectory compares to, on average, how much reward do we get from that state onwards. So if in any previous time we were in that state, on average, how, do we make, how much do we get? And do we do better or worse than what we get on average from that state? If we did better, crank up the probability of the actions we took. Do worse, bring it down. Now, we might not have exactly available how much you on average get from that state, but that's kind of a, maybe an ideal thing we could put there. And in practice, we'll put an approximation. OK, so the important thing here is that we now sum from the current time onwards when we look at the rewards that we multiply in, not reward for the entire trajectory. So we're exploring the temporal structure. Remember early on I said um, the methods we looked at, the finite difference, the cross entry method don't really look at the temporal structure. Here, we're now looking at the temporal structure. We're specifically looking at increasing or decreasing probability of an action based on specifically what happened from that action onwards, as opposed to always looking at entire trajectories. OK, so what might be some good choices for B? You can take a constant, constant baseline, which is just average reward along trajectory. So we know we can take any constant there. It's fine. It'll always still be a correct policy gradient. But the benefit we get from using something more precise is that we reduce the variance. And we need less samples to get a precise estimate of our policy gradient. So this, this is one thing we can fill in. But it's not that great. It doesn't exploit any temporal aspects. Um, you can do something like optimal baseline, which means you can do some math and say, I want to minimize the variance of my policy gradient estimate. That's an objective. If I work through that objective, falls out a baseline you're supposed to use to optimize that objective. What is that doing? It's saying, I'm going to use as my baseline a weighted. So instead of just the unweighted average of rewards, still an average of rewards along trajectories, but it's a weighted average where things that have very high grad log probability squared, so things where the derivative of the action given state is very steep, will contribute more highly to the average than things where it's a less steep uh, derivative. So that's, that's the optimal way of reweighting your rewards. Um, so that's one thing you could do. 
you can make it time dependent. You can see my baseline will only look at things then onwards, not things that happened in the past. Um, so I only look at, let's say, for time slice t, I look on average from t onwards over all trajectories, how much did I get averaged at? You can make it state dependent. So you can say, my baseline is going to depend on the state. How much reward do I expect to get from that state? That's the value function for that state. We'll need a way to estimate that value function, but in principle, that's, a very, that's the most natural thing to choose, because that's really the comparison we want. What's the value I expect from that state under my current policy? Did I do better or worse? Accordingly, shift the probability mass. So we'll look at that in a moment, how to get that. OK, so different choices here. Most common is to try to put the value function there. So how do we get the value function? Well, so we need this thing over here. How do we get it? Note this is not an optimal value function. So we don't need to find the optimal value function. We need the value of the policy. We've actually looked at this in the past. We can do policy evaluation. But policy evaluation requires a model to run all the update equations. We can do something much simpler, though. We can just collect trajectories. And we, re we can regress against the empirical return. So we can just say, for all trajectories we collected, I can look at a slice of that trajectory from time t onwards and look how much reward was obtained. And I can see the value under my policy in that state st in trajectory i is approximated by the sample estimate. And I'm going to say I'm going to essentially do just train a neural net that maps from state to reward achieved from that state onwards across my trajectories. I train a neural net, and then I can use it to then uh, subtract it out as a way that might generalize better than um, you know, just doing some sample-based evaluation. So I'm going to compute v phi. So phi is not a parameter here. I have a parameterized value function, and I can just run gradient descent on this objective here, just a supervised learning problem, straight up supervised learning to get the value function out. To do this correctly, um, you actually have to use separate uh, samples for um, fitting the value function and for computing your policy gradient. It should be pretty clear why. Why? Imagine you do something very, you have an extremely good value function fitter, and it perfectly fits everything. Well, then this thing will be exactly equal to this thing, and if you look at the policy gradient, these two things will cancel out. So that's not going to work. You don't get a policy gradient estimate. Again, that, that's natural because you're trying to compare this sample estimate, what you got in this sample, with the average. But if your average estimate is just using the sample directly, then you're not really comparing with the average. So you need to have a separate set of rollouts based on which you compute the average. And so you have a separate set of rollouts for which you do this. In practice, often what you can do is not worry about it. The reason you can decide not to worry about it is because your value function is not going to be perfectly fitting these, um, these rewards. It'll try to general, generalize across many, of, many rollouts. And so in practice, you can often just do it. But in the extreme, if you had something that perfectly fitted your samples, you can't do it on the same samples. Also, in practice, often you will not change your value function completely to the optimum here. You'll just make a few gradient updates. And you already have a value function from the previous round. And so effectively incorporating a lot of past samples to get your value function estimate for the current round. Okay? So, but keep that in mind that in principle, theoretically speaking, if you do what's shown on this slide, you need a separate set of trajectories to get your v phi. Yes? Would you do your value function fitting before policy gradient, or would you do them kind of like at the same time? Uh, what do you fit first? Um, that's a good question. It, in principle, it could come first. Um, doesn't really matter. But the, the reason to do it first would be that effectively, you would definitely not be using those samples then. So you use all past trajectories from as you're running your policy gradient, have your best value function estimate based on that. You do a new rollout. Use, since we know you can use any baseline, any baseline is fine, right? It's just the closer to the value function, the better it's going to perform. So we can use it. But we can use any baseline. We can use based on all past samples. 
get that value function, use that, and then afterwards incorporate these samples to update the value function, use the next one, and repeat. You don't need to do, uh, this is called Monte Carlo estimation, estimation of VPI. Why is that? Because you use the exact, you use rollouts to estimate um, your value function. You can also do bootstrapping. So remember the Bellman equation for policy evaluation? Well, you can do a sample-based uh, evaluation of that. So shown at the bottom here, you can run an optimization that tries to make the value function at the next time consistent with the value function at the current time, and then some regularization to make sure you don't overfit. What would you use? Would you use Monte Carlo or would you use Bootstrap? Well, that's a design choice. You can choose whatever you want to do. And we'll actually see mixes between the two of them at some point. Um, but in practice, if you're trying to get something working, this thing with the Bootstrap in it has some weird feedback cycle in it. The next value function depends on the previous one, the previous one, and so forth. And so it's often not as stable to run. So in your first implementations, Typically, you would use Monte Carlo, use a large number of samples, you fit your value function, in, then separate set of samples to get the grad log probabilities from, and that way you know you're doing theoretically the right thing, and in a limit of enough samples, this should work. Now, this thing in principle can be more sample efficient, but can give you a lot of challenges in making sure it's stable. So at this point, we actually have a complete policy gradient algorithm. We can Let's step through what we have. We initialize our policy parameter, typically a vector theta, some baseline we might have available. Then some iterations. We collect a set of trajectories by executing the current policy. At each time step in each trajectory, we compute the return RT then onward. So we store that information as we run through a trajectory. We store reward accumulated then onwards. We then compute the advantage estimate, which is the reward accumulated then onwards minus the baseline from that state. Now, how do we get the baseline? Well, typically by value function fitting. So we refit the baseline, this comes to your question. We first compute the advantage, we first compute that difference. After we've computed the difference, we can refit the value function. So the difference is not being computed based on the new, new samples, have not computed the value function. So this is the order in which it goes. Compute the advantage, can refit the value function ready for next time. So value function here is called B. Then we sum this. Uh, we take all these terms. We can now compute a gradient estimate, which is this summation of, summation of all these terms. We take a step in that direction and repeat. So not that many lines of code, actually. right? It's fairly simple in many ways. Um, and it will be uh, I mean, we can still do additional tweaks to this to make this more efficient, but this is the foundation of pretty much any policy grand algorithm will look exactly like this. So any questions about this algorithm? So what are we still missing um, to make it even more efficient and that I should lead the things that have led to the actual breakthroughs in deep reinforcement that started to happen in 2013, 14, 15 are the three pieces that are still listed there. That is, the difference we're computing here, advantage here, the reward then onwards minus the baseline, it's still a pretty noisy estimate based on what I described so far. How can we make this less noisy? That's what A2C, A3C, and GAE are about. And then the other part that we haven't really looked at is step sizing. Remember we had line searches in optimization and so forth, but line searches are expensive in RL because you take a step, you do many rollouts, make a smaller step or a bigger step, very expensive. And remember we looked at things like natural gradients, second order methods, and again those have been key to kind of take this to a level that it works for large scale neural net training for policies rather than um, only working for very small problems. All right, that's it for today, and we'll cover these three next time.